a quaint coastal town on the edge of Maine, where the great sea stretches ever outward, the sky rains clear and high above, and charmed bloodroot leaves lurk in slug-haunted corners of local gardens. Welcome to Voices of Dunnet Landing. Good night, listeners. I come to you, fresh off the tragic and final farewell of the most respectable Mrs. Begg, as she was seen off by friends and neighbors alike to the great unknown voyage only known to us as death. But we should not dwell in uncertainty for the fate of the most respectable Mrs. Begg, but hopefully our guest for tonight will help liven things up. Please join me in welcoming Dunnet Landing's own Honorable Captain Littlepage. Well, hello, Honorable Captain Littlepage. Welcome to the show. It's a real shame about Mrs. Begg leaving us here on this material plane. She is gone. Very easy at the last, I was informed. She slipped away as if she were glad of the opportunity. She was one of the old stock. She was very much looked up to in this town and will be missed. It may be found out some of these days. We may know it all. The next step, where Mrs. Begg is now, for instance. Certainty, not conjecture, is what we all desire. We shall know it while yet below. We have not looked for truth in the right direction. I know what I speak of. Those who have laughed at me little know how much reason my ideas are based upon. In that handful of houses, they fancy that they comprehend the universe. I am an old man, as you can see. I've been a shipmaster the greater part of my life, four to three years in all. You may not think it, but I am above eighty years of age. You must have left the sea a good many, many years ago then, Captain Littlepage. I should have been serviceable at least five or six years more. My acquaintance with certain... Um, my... Experience upon a certain occasion, I might say, gave rise to prejudice. I do not mind telling you that I chanced to learn of one of the greatest discoveries that man has ever made. I had a valuable cargo of general merchandise from the London docks to Fort Churchill, a station of the old company on Hudson's Bay. We was delayed in landing and baffled by headwinds and a heavily tumbling sea all the way north, then the fog kept us off the coast, and when I made port at last, it was too late to delay in those northern waters, especially with such a vessel and such a crew as I had. They cared for nothing, and idled me into a fit of sickness. But my first mate was a good, excellent man, with no more idea of being frozen in there until spring than I had, so we made what speed we could to get clear Hudson's Bay and off the coast. I owned an eighth of the vessel, and he owned a sixteenth of her. She was a full-rigged ship, called the Minerva, but she was getting old and leaky. I meant it should be my last viage in her, and so it proved. She'd been an excellent vessel in her day. Of the cowards aboard her, I can't say so much. Then you were wrecked? I wasn't caught stern by none lighter than fault of mine. We left Fort Churchill and run into the bay with a light pair of heels but I had been vexed to death with their red tape rigging at the company's office and chilled with staying on deck and trying to hurry up things, and when we was well outside of land, heading for Hudson Straits, I had a bad turn of some sort of fever and had to stay below. The days was getting short, and we made good runs, all well on board but me, and the crew done their work by dint of hard driving. So there we was, blowing along anyways. Uh, before that, let's hear a word from one of our sponsors. Have aches and pains? Suffering the afflictions of life? Need a little pick-me-up after your weekend soiree? Then come on down to Miss Todd's Herbalist Shop in Scenic Dunnock Landing for all of your medicinal needs. Miss Todd's Herbalist Shop is the natural answer to all your problems, with each remedy made from 100% genuine, small-town, hand-grown roots and herbs that are specially selected just for you. Just off Route 1, past the old light post and the shack that smells like fish. Open weekdays from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Miss Todd's Herbalist Shop. Hope to cure you soon. Perhaps we could move on to more interesting topics. It must have been hard living at sea back then. It was a dog's life, but it made men of those who followed it. I see a change for the worse, even in our town here. Full of loafers now, small and poor as it is, who once would have followed the sea, every last soul of them. There is no occupation so fit for just that class of men who never get beyond the forecastle. 
I view it in addition that a community narrows down and grows dreadful ignorant when it is shut up in its own affairs and gets no knowledge of the outside world except from a cheap, unprincipled newspaper. In the old days, a good part of the best men here knew a hundred ports and something of the way folks lived in them. They saw the world for themselves and, like's not their wives and children, saw it with them. They might not have had the best of knowledge to carry with them sightseeing, but they were some acquainted with foreign lands and their laws and could see outside the battle for town clerk here in Dunnet. They got some sense of proportion. Yes, they lived more dignified. In their houses was better within and without. Shipping's a terrible loss to this part of New England from a social point of view, ma'am. I thought of that as well. It's resulted in so much change, particularly the sad disappearance of sea captains, right? A shipmaster was apt to get the habit of reading. A captain is not expected to be familiar with his crew, and for captain's sake in dull days and nights, he turns to his book. Most of us old shipmasters came to know most everything about something. One would take to reading on farming topics, and some was great on medicine, but Lord help their poor crews, or some was all for history, and... Now and then there'd be, like me, that gave his time to the poets. I was well acquainted with a shipmaster that was all for bees and beekeeping, and if you met him in port and went aboard, he'd sit and talk a terrible while about their having so much information and the money that could be made out of keeping them. He was one of the smartest captains that ever sailed the seas, but they used to call Newcastle, a great bark he commanded for many years, Tuttle's Beehive. Then there was old Captain Jameson, he had notions of Solomon's temple and made a very handsome little model of the same, right from the scripture measurements, same as other sailors make little ships and design new tricks of rigging and all that. Now, there's nothing to take the place of shipping in a place like ours. These bicycles offend me dreadfully. They don't afford no real opportunities of experience such as a man gained on a voyage. Now, when folks left home in the old days, they left it to some purpose. And when they got home, they stared there and had some pride in it. There's no large-minded way of thinking now. The worst have got to be the best and rule everything. We're all turned upside down and going back year by year. Uh, now, why don't you tell us a bit more about your journey on the Minerva? It must have been rough. I shall be glad to explain to you. If I had a map at hand, I could explain better. We were driven to and fro way up toward what we used to call Harry's discoveries and lost our bearings. It was thick and foggy, and at last I lost my ship. She drove on a rock, and we managed to get ashore in what I took to be a barren island, the few of us that was left alive. When she first struck, the sea was somewhat calmer than it had been, and most of the crew, against orders, manned the longboat and put off in a hurry, and was never heard of more. Our own boat upset, but the carpenter kept himself and me above water and we drifted in. I had no strength to call upon after my recent fever and laid down to die. But I found the tracks of a man and dog, and the second day, we got along the shore to one of them far missionary stations that the Moravians support. They was very poor themselves and in distress. It was a useless place. There was but few Eskimo left in that region. There we remained for some time, and I became acquainted with... Strange events. There was a supply ship expected, and the pastor, an excellent Christian man, made no doubt that we should get passage in her. He was hoping that orders would come to break up the station, but everything was uncertain, and we got on the best we could for a while. We fished and helped the people in other ways. There was no other way of paying our debts. I was taken to the pastor's house until I got better, and they were crowded, and I felt myself in the way and made excuse to join with an old seaman, a Scotchman, who had built him a warm cabin and had room in it for another. He was looked upon with regard and had stood by the pastor in some troubles with the people. He'd been, he'd been on one of them English exploring parties that found one of the end of the road to the North Pole but never could find the other. We lived like dogs in a kennel, or so you'd thought if you had seen the hut from the outside. The main thing was keep warm. There were piles of bird skins to lay on, and he'd made him a good bunk, and there was another for me. It was dreadfully dreary waiting there. We'd begun to think the supply steamer was lost, and my poor ship broke up and strewn herself all across the shore. 
We got to watching on the headings. My men and me knew the people were short of supplies and had to pinch themselves. It ought to read in the Bible, man cannot live by fish alone. If they'd told the truth, thanks. Tain't bread that wears the worst on you. First part of the time, old Gaffet, that I lived with, seemed speechless. And I didn't know what to make of him, nor he of me, I dare say. But as we'd gotten acquainted, I found he'd been through more disasters than I had, and had more troubles that one not going to let him live a great while. He used to ease his mind to talk to an understanding person, so we used to sit and talk together all day. It rained or blew so we couldn't get out. I got a bad blow on the back of my head at the time we came ashore, and it pained me at times, and my strength was broken anyway. Never been so able since. Then I had the good of my reading. I had no books. The pastor spoke but little English, and all his books were foreign. But I used to say over all I could remember. The old poets little knew what comfort they could be to a man. I was well acquainted with the works of Milton, but up there it did seem to me as if Shakespeare was the king. He has his sea terms very accurate, and some beautiful passage was common to the mind. I could say them over until I shed tears. There was nothing beautiful to me in that place but the stars above and, and passages of verse. Wait, wait. Tell us more about this Gaffet person. Oh, Gaffet was always brooding and brooding and talking to himself. He was afraid he should never get away and preyed upon his mind. He thought when I got home I could interest the scientific men in his discovery. But they're all taken up with their own notions. Some didn't even take pains to answer the letters I wrote. You observe that I said this crippled man, Gaffet, had been shipped on a voyage of discovery. I now tell you that the ship was lost on its return. and Only Gaffet and two officers were saved off the Greenland coast, and he had knowledge later that those men never got back to England. The brig they shipped on was run down in the night. So no other living soul had the facts, and he gave them to me. There's a strange sort of a country way up north beyond the ice, and strange folks living there. Gaffet believed it was the next world to this. Honorable Captain Littlepage, what on earth do you mean? To hear old Gaffet tell about it was something awful. It was first a tale of dogs and sledges, and cold and wind and snow. Then they begun to find the ice grow rotten. They'd been frozen in and got into a current flowing north, far up beyond the Fox Channel. And they took to their boats when the ship got crushed, and this warm current took them out of sight of the ice and into the great open sea. And they still followed it due north, just the very way they had planned to go. And they struck a coast that wasn't laid down or charted, but the cliffs were such that no boat could land until they found a bay and struck across under sail to the other side where the shore looked lower. And there were scanty provisions and out of water, but they got sight of something that looked like a great town. For God's sake, Gaffet, I says, the first time he told me. You don't mean a town two degrees farther north than ships have ever been? Well, he got their course marked on an old chart that he'd paced out at the top, but he insisted upon it, and told it over and over again to be sure I had it straight to carry those who could be interested. There was no snow and ice, he said, after they had sailed some days with that warm current which seemed to come right from under the ice that they'd been pinched up in and had been crossing on foot for weeks. But what about the town? Did they get to the town? Well, they did, and found inhabitants. It was an awful condition of things. It appeared, as near as Gaffet could express it, like a place where there was neither living nor dead. They could see the place where they was approaching it by sea pretty near like any town, and thick with habitations. But all at once they lost sight of it altogether. And when they got close in shore, they could see the shapes of folks, but they never could get near them. All blowing gray figures that would pass along alone, sometimes gathered along in companies as if they was watching. The men was frightened at first, but the shapes never came near them. It was as if they blew back. And at last they all got bold and went ashore and found bird's eggs and sea fowl, like any wild northern spot where creatures was tame and folks had never been. There was good water. Gaffet said that he and another man came near one of the fog-shaped men that was going along slow with the look of a pack on his back among the rocks, and they chased him. But, Lord, he flitted away out of sight like a leaf the wind takes with it or a piece of cobweb. Uh, sir, please remain seated so the mics don't lose you. They would make as if they talked together, but there was no sound of voices. And they acted as if they didn't see us, but... Only felt us coming towards them, says Gaffet one day, trying to tell the particulars. They couldn't see the town when they was ashore. One day the captain and the doctor was gone till night up across the highland where the town had seemed to be. 
and they came back at night beat out and white as ashes, and wrote and wrote all next day in their notebooks, and whispered together full of excitement, and they were sharp-spoken with the men when they offered to ask any questions. And there came a day. The men all swore they wouldn't stay any longer. The man on watch early in the morning gave the alarm, and they all put off in the boat and got a little way out to sea. Those folks, or whatever they was, come about em like bats. All at once they raised incessant armies, and come as if to drive em back to sea. They stood thick at the edge of the water like the ridges of grim war. No thought of flight, none of retreat. Sometimes a standing fight, and soaring on main wing tormented all the air. And when they'd got the boat out of reach of danger, Gaffet said they looked back, and there was the town again, standing up just as if they'd seen it at first, coming on the coast. Say what you might, they all believed t'was a kind of waiting place between this world and the next. Gaffer thought the officers was hurrying home to report and to fit out a new expedition when they was lost. At the time, the men got orders not to talk over what they had seen. And before we get any further into that, why don't we hear another word from one of our sponsors? Trying to buy a home but don't know where to turn? Want to own land? Let the experts at Dunnett Landing Realty take all the stress out of moving. Our team of qualified realtors will work with you every step of the way to ensure the smoothest transition possible into your new life. We have a number of properties throughout the town in the surrounding countryside. But wait, there's more. Don't like neighbors? Living alone? Would rather provide for yourself than depending on loved ones? Have we got the place for you? We have recently acquired a listing for a small island home at a very reasonable price. Give us a call for a free consultation. Did we mention we have an island? Dunnett Landing Realty, serving your country since 1988. Honorable Captain Littlepage, they must have been starving, right? Or was it a mirage or something? Gaffet had got so that his mind ran on nothing else. The ship's surgeon let fall an opinion to the captain one day that twas some condition of the light and the magnetic currents that let them seat those folks. Went to right feeling part of the world anyway. They had to battle with the compass to make it serve, and everything seemed to go wrong. Gavity worked it out in his own mind that they was all common ghosts, but the conditions was unusual favorable for seeing them. He was always talking about the geographical society, but he never took proper steps, and as I viewed it now, and stayed right there at the mission. He was a good deal crippled and thought they'd confine him in some jail of a hospital. He said he was waiting to find the right men to tell, somebody bound north. Once in a while they stopped there to leave a mail or something. He was setting his notions and let two or three proper exploring expeditions go by him because he didn't like their looks. But when I was there, he got restless, fearing he might be taken away or something. He had all his directions written out, straight as string, to give the right ones. I wanted him to trust me, so I might have something to show, but he wouldn't. I suppose he's dead now. I wrote to him and done all I could. It will be a great exploit some of these days. Well, what an unexpectedly riveting story. Thank you, Honorable Captain Littlepage, for joining us on our little show here. Of course. And as for you, dear listeners, keep your eyes out for creatures of fog and cobweb. They could be lurking in your consciousness without your knowledge, lingering in the blind spots just on the edge of your peripheral vision. And tonight, as you sink into the depths of unconsciousness, keep an eye out for the respectful Mrs. Begg in her ongoing journey. Thank you for listening, and good night, Dunnett Landing. Good night, 